Good afternoon, everyone. It's yeah, it's it's. Thank you. It's great to have all of you here for this uh, briefing. Uh, we have three distinguished speakers for you today. Uh, Mr. Pateri Talas, the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, Maria Fernandez, uh, Fernanda Espinosa Garces, the President of the General Assembly, and the Secretary General. And uh, they will all, all speak to you about uh, the latest report uh, of the World Meteorological Organization on the state of the global climate in 2018. You can get copies of that report at the door. Uh, and we will first turn to Professor Talas. Thank you, and also welcome on, on my behalf. Uh, it's early, early evening in Geneva, and, uh, and my brains are a little bit in Geneva time. So if I'm a little bit lost, uh, it's because of, uh, because of that. Uh, WMO is the United Nations Specialized Agency on Weather, Climate, and, and, and Water, and uh, we are publishing uh, on an annual basis uh, status of climate uh, reports, and, and so far we have been doing it in Geneva. But this year we are very honored that we have both the President of General Assembly and the Secretary General Guterres uh, present here, and, uh, and, and this report is also feeding into the climate summit of, uh, of Secretary General, which, which he is going to host here in September. And, uh, and at WMO, we are a fact-based organization. I will show you some facts ab about uh, climate uh, and also disasters, and, uh, and, and, and thereafter we will hear interventions by two distinguished speakers, and, and thereafter you will have a chance to ask uh, questions and, and, and comment my presentation. So we publish this kind of report on an annual basis, and, um, and, and here we have the most recent uh, findings of uh, what's happening to our climate system. And one of the things that we have been uh, often showing is uh, what's happening to the temperature, and we, so far we have seen one degree warming of the planet, and, um, and, and uh, so far the warmest year on record was 2016, when we had uh, so-called El Nino effect uh, boosting the temperatures. Uh, last year was uh, so-called La Nina year, which meant uh, colder temperatures in the Pacific uh, uh, Ocean uh, temperatures, and, uh, but the last four years have been the warmest uh, uh, years on record uh, so far. And if you look at the global map, uh, these red colors indicate uh, de de positive deviations, so warmer than normally. We have uh, typically always seen the highest deviations in the Arctic, and, and they are double digit as compared to the rest of the world. And you can see some, some bluish area, which is indicating that we have so-called uh, La Nina year, which is uh, uh, temperatures of the, of the Pacific uh, Oceans. And, um, and, and last year was uh, the warmest uh, La Nina year on, on record. So we, have, uh, we can say that the climate change is still proceeding, although we, uh, 2018 wasn't the warmest year on, on, on record. So the previous La Nina years, uh, 2011 and so forth, they have been much colder than the, than the year uh, last year. And, and we were facing uh, several heat waves uh, uh, last year, and, and especially uh, uh, Western and Northern Europe uh, were exposed to uh, unusually high temperatures, which led uh, both to casualties, record-breaking uh, uh, forest fires, and, and also severe loss in agriculture. And, and globally, we can say that we have uh, started seeing growing amount of uh, health impacts uh, caused by uh, uh, heat waves, and, and you can see that the heat wave exposure of human beings has, uh, has been rising since, since year 2000, and uh, today we have uh, between 150 million to 200 million people on an annual basis uh, who are exposed to very high temperatures. And actually, we have been storing most of the extra heat on this planet uh, to the oceans. 93% uh, of the extra heat that we have produced to the system have been uh, stored to the oceans, and, and they have been warming by, 
by half degree. And this is showing what has happened uh, in the uppermost 700 meters of the, of the oceans. And, and that's, that's where we have the main heat uh, source of the, of the planet. We are also reporting what's happening to the precipitation. And in, in, in general, we have started seeing more prevailing drought in low latitudes and in southern hemisphere and, and, and more uh, 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 rainfall in the, in the high northern latitudes. And last, uh, last year, we had uh, uh, unusually dry period in, in, again, the same heat wave area in northern Europe and, uh, and, and western Europe. And we had some severe flooding events. And, and uh, one of the most severe flooding events was uh, Hurricane Florence, which was hitting, hitting uh, the east coast of the uh, of United uh, sta States. Uh, it was related to hurricane. But the most uh, uh, difficult uh, damages or major damages were related to the, to the amount of uh, rainfall. And because of the, the climate change, we have started seeing growing amount of uh, more category four and five uh, hurricanes and, and, and typhoons. And, and we have also more humidity in the lower atmosphere, which is contributing to the rainfall amounts. So we, we often have more severe flooding pro problems related to those, uh, those events. And that was also the case in, in Hurricane Florence. And, and, and the cost of that was uh, exceeding 1 billion US dollars. There was also a very severe uh, uh, typhoon season hitting uh, Eastern Asia, Japan, China, uh, Philippines, uh, and other countries in the region. And, uh, and, and, uh, and that's also related to the warming of the oceans. We can say, say that because of the warm, warmed uh, temperatures in the oceans, we, can, we have more energy for these uh, tropical storms. And we, we were having uh, several so-called super typhoons hitting, hitting, for example, China and uh, Japan. And most recent uh, event uh, has been taking place in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and, uh, and Malawi. We were having the tropical cyclone Idai. And, and uh, the problem uh, was uh, wind speed, but we were having also storm surge. The sea level was rising by 4.4 meters, and we had also a severe amount of uh, rainfall which, which, uh, in, a, in a fairly flat, uh, flat area. And so far, we have seen a little bit less than 1,000 casualties, but we expect that uh, number to rise. And, and, uh, and it's difficult to say whether this is related to climate change, but statistically we can say that uh, because of the, of the warmer sea temperatures and uh, a higher amount of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, we, can, we are expecting to see such e events to happen more often. FAO has estimated uh, what is the health impact of, uh, of disasters, and, uh, and, and we have uh, seen uh, famine problems uh, hitting especially those countries uh, who are exposed to uh, uh, climate extremes. And that's especially the case in, in African, African countries. And, and there have been uh, up to almost 600 million people who are who have been exposed to such, uh, such problems. We have new statistics on, on what has happened to disasters during the past uh, 10 years. And, uh, and, and we have seen flooding problems. Uh, we have seen drought problems, uh, heat wave problems and also storm problems, and, uh, and, and about half of the world population have been exposed to major natural disaster like the one, uh, ones that I was just uh, describing. We have uh, uh, changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere, and, and the carbon dioxide uh, concentration still continues to rise, and we have about 150% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as compared to the situation uh, during the pre-industrial uh, times. And carbon dioxide is the major problem here. It has contributed uh, at uh, two-thirds of the warming is because of uh, carbon dioxide, and its lifetime is uh, for several hundreds of years. So this uh, problem doesn't disappear uh, very soon, and, and that's why we have to act uh, as, as soon as, as possible. And if you look at the emissions, what has happened to the global emissions, uh, during the past three years, we have seen an increase in the, in the amount of emissions, and uh, last year's estimate is 2.7% uh, increase. And, and the emissions have been rising in all of the other regions, uh, excluding Europe, where we have seen a slight uh, decrease of the, of the emissions. And this is not very good news uh, when we think about the uh, implementation of the Paris uh, Agreement. And uh, then what are the reasons for the 
for the, for this uh, this carbon dioxide increase it's mainly fossil fossil fuel consumption to to small degree land use uh, chains and oceans uh, serve as a sink of uh, carbon whereas uh, and, and also vegetation serves as a sink for carbon but about half of the extra extra carbon dioxide remains in the in the atmosphere and we have started seeing also changes in the chemical composition of the seawater this is a time series from Hawaii for the past uh, 30 years, uh, showing that uh, seawater is getting more acid uh, because we have uh, injected more carbon dioxide. And, and there's an estimation that uh, the pH is lowest in 25 million years. Sea level rise uh, has continued. We have satellite measurements since 93, and, and besides that, we have, before that, we have. Uh, uh, other measurements, and, and we have seen so far 26 centimeters uh, sea level rise. Uh, we, have, we are also melting the glaciers, and, uh, and the melting of the glaciers have been intensified, and that's contributing to the sea level rise, and, uh, and it's also contributing to the lack of uh, water in big rivers, uh, which have their origins from Himalayas, uh, Andes, uh, Alps, and, and Rocky Mountains. Last year, we had uh, a somewhat uh, larger uh, amount of uh, ocean depletion as compared to the previous uh, years, although we, ha we have been uh, seeing an improvement in the ozone layer over Antarctic, uh, Antarctic area. And uh, climate change is also contributing to the uh, ozone problem. Uh, the, uh, the, mid the middle atmosphere is getting colder, which is giving more energy for, for, the, for the ozone depletion phenomenon. And finally, uh, what is our, uh, our challenge uh, when it comes to uh, climate change? Uh, this picture is showing how we are producing energy uh, uh, globally. And you can see that we have, there has been an increase of oil and, uh, oil and gas uh, consumption and also slight increase recently in coal consumption. And we produce about, only about 15% of our energy based on nuclear hydro and renewables. And, and to be successful in Paris Agreement implementation, we should revert those numbers uh, in the coming decades. And this is from the most recent IPCC report, which was published in October. What, is, what, what kind of paths we should follow if we would li like to reach the targets of Paris Agreement between 1.5 and, and 2 degrees uh, warming? If you, if, you, if you follow this uh, green line here, we would reach 1.5 degree warming, but that would mean that we should stop uh, this emission growth in the coming five years and, uh, and be carbon neutral by 2050. And if we would like to reach two degrees, we have uh, uh, ten, ten, 10 more years uh, time to, to turn our emissions to uh, dropping path and, and, and be carbon neutral by 2070s. And if we don't do anything, then we are, there's a risk that we would reach uh, three to five degrees uh, warmer planet, planet by this, uh, this century, uh, century, and that would be a major disaster for the, for the, for the, for, for the planet. And finally, to summarize, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, seen uh, uh, record uh, warm temperatures during the past uh, four years. We have seen, uh, again, records in greenhouse gas con concentrations. We have uh, reached one degree warming so far. Uh, glaciers uh, are melting. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, sea ice is declining, especially in the Arctic. And, um, and, and, and uh, we have started seeing growing amount of uh, disasters because of, uh, of climate change. And, and we have stored uh, most of the extra heat to the, to the oceans. So this was my, uh, my, my introductory uh, lecture. And, 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 and these uh, findings are all uh, found in this uh, report. If you want to get copies, we have some, some here. And there are some available by the doors. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. Um, as you may imagine, as a geographer, I, I tend to love maps and figures, but I didn't like these maps and figures, to be very honest uh, with you. But thank you very much, Professor Talas, for sharing these very worrisome highlights of the World Meteorological Organization statement 
on the state of the global climate in 2018, but it also have an update on extreme weather of 2019. So it is a very, very valuable tool. Thank you, Secretary General, for being here among us. Uh, we just uh, all came uh, from the opening of the high-level meeting on protection of the global climate for present and future generations of humankind. As you know, this is an event that is taking place today and tomorrow. Uh, we would like to congratulate uh, the very professional, serious scientific work of the WMO. Uh, this is the 25th edition of the report, 25 years. Uh, I think that the information that is provided by the WMO, it's uh, really a hard, uh, scientific, uh, informative, that complements uh, the IPCC uh, work, because IPCC, as you know, has a seven-year reporting cycle, so it does help. Uh, it provides very critical information, solid scientific basis, and I think it is uh, really very important, as you know, uh, climate change uh, connected to the Sustainable Development Goals is one of the priorities of this year's presidency. And uh, my pledge has been that we do need a holistic understanding of the socioeconomic consequences of increasingly intense uh, extreme weather on countries around the world. Uh, the current report that we just heard of uh, makes an important contribution to our combined international action to focus attention on this very critical problem. Uh, we have heard the numbers, I won't repeat them, but just to keep that in mind, from 1.6% CO2 emissions growth in 2017, we passed to 2.7% growth in CO2 emissions in 2018. So these are really not good news. Ex extreme weather and climate events affected nearly 62 million people, we heard, in 2018. Uh, the UN uh, Environment uh, Emissions Gap reports tells us, and uh, the figures you, sh you show, Professor Talas, that we need to multiply by three and by five the current level of ambition degree that we agreed upon in the Paris Agreement. So we need to scale up ambition. I think that is one of the messages we need more, as the Secretary General mentioned this morning, we need action. We need to walk the talk urgently. It's not that we have a lot of time ahead of us. Uh, today and tomorrow's event on, on climate and sustainable development for all was, as you know, mandated by the General Assembly. And um, to look at, uh, at climate uh, from the broader spectrum, to connect a climate ambition and climate action to the sustainable uh, development uh, goals. We have here in-house five uh, heads of state and government. Today, around 25 state ministers that have come to New York to express their commitment, to express uh, you know, how they are uh, ready to scale up ambition and to deliver on the Paris Agreement and to the implementation of uh, the uh, Katowice uh, rule book. This morning we heard from the previous uh, um, um, COP president, the current uh, COP president, and the uh, future uh, COP presidents. And basically, I would say that there was like one common thread, which was implementation, delivery, action oriented. And I think that we are going to see this precisely uh, during uh, the uh, climate summit that was uh, called by the Secretary General in September. So we need to act and to act now. Uh, this uh, numbers and data is extremely worrisome, Professor Talas, and I think that uh, we are capable. We have the science, we have the knowledge, we have the technology, we have the tools in hand. And uh, what happens sometimes is that uh, the political times, the, the times of po politics and politicians is shorter than the times to na uh, for nature to adapt to, uh, to critical uh, challenges and changes. So we need to act. We need to connect political times to the times of nature. And we need to act and act now. Thank you for the great work of the WMO. I insist these are very uh, worrisome uh, data and information, and that it doubles 
uh, our commitment and our effort uh, to act and act now. I think we will have the opportunity to hear from our leaders today and tomorrow and to have a substantive uh, outcome of, of these two days of, uh, of dialogue, engagement, and commitment to uh, feed into the climate summit uh, in September. So thank you once again, and congratulations to the WMO. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, thank you very much for your presence. I have to say that as Secretary General of the United Nations, I'm very proud of the work of the World Meteorological Organization. It provides a very solid scientific base for the analysis that uh, uh, is uh, absolutely essential uh, in relation to how climate change is evolving and uh, as a clear guide to our action in the future. And I'm very grateful for the work that once again was done this year. Climate change continues to accelerate. And reading the report, three things stand out. First, we are seeing record highs in land and ocean temperatures, sea levels, and greenhouse gas concentrations. Second, we are seeing more and more the dramatic impact of extreme weather conditions. Last year in the United States alone, we saw 14 weather and climate-related disasters where the devastation costed more than $1 billion each, with a total of some 49 billion US dollars. Worldwide, more than 35 million people were affected by floods, and Cyclone Idai in Southern Africa is a particularly stark recent example, as it was demonstrated. Third, the impact on public health is escalating. The average number of people exposed to heat waves has increased by some 125 million since the beginning of the century with deadly consequences. The combination of extreme heat and air pollution is proving increasingly dangerous, especially as heat waves will become longer, more intense, and more frequent. So this report is indeed another strong wake-up call. It proves what we have been saying, that climate change is moving faster than our efforts to address it. And that is the reason of the Climate Action Summit that we will have here in New York, the 23rd of September. It is important that we tackle climate change with much greater ambition. And I am telling leaders, don't come with a speech, come with a plan. I'm calling on them to come to the summit with concrete, realistic plans to put us on a sustainable path once and for all. And that means enhancing national determined contributions under the Paris Agreement by 2020 and showing how we can reduce greenhouse gases emissions by 45% over the next decade and get to net zero emissions globally by 2050. If not, it will be irreversible not to be able to achieve the goals that were established in Paris. We are very close to the moment in which it will no longer be possible come to the end of the century with only 1.5 degrees. We have very few years to reverse this trend because the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere will not disappear. And so we are getting close to the moment in which irreversibly will be much worse than the scenario that uh, was described by the uh, IPCC. And this is what science say that is needed. And it is also what young people around the globe are now rightfully demanding. I want the summit to demonstrate the benefits of climate action and how everyone can believe, benefit. A growing number of governments, cities, and businesses, it is true, are already understanding that climate solutions can strengthen our economies, improve air quality and public health, and protect our environment. And we expect initiatives in a diversity of sectors, such as energy, sustainable agriculture, forests, oceans, and resilience to climate impacts. And I hope it will also highlight the importance of gender diversity in all decision making, and emphasize the importance of a just transition where no one is left disadvantaged by the necessary climate action. These are the only ways we can ensure that no one is left behind by the transformations that we need. It is clear that the transformation is underway, 
but it is clear that is not as quick as needed. But new technologies are already delivering energy at a lower cost than the fossil fuel driven economy. Solar and onshore wind are now the cheapest sources of new power in virtually all major economies. So we can and must accelerate the transition. And this means ending subsidies for fossil fuels and high emitting unsustainable agriculture and shifting towards renewable energy, electric vehicles and climate smart practices. And it means carbon pricing that reflects the true cost of emissions from climate risk to the health hazards of air pollution. And it means accelerating the closure of coal plants, halting plans for new ones, and replacing those jobs with LCR alternatives so the transformation is just, inclusive, and profitable. The coming years will see vast investment in infrastructure around the world. We must ensure that this infrastructure will be sustainable and climate friendly. If not, we'll be locked into a runaway climate change. By doing so, we can avert the threat of irreversible climate disruption and march far down the road to realizing the 2030 agenda. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll now open up the floor for questions. Uh, I believe the Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly will have to be departing shortly, so uh, the first few questions uh, should be directed to them before they need to go, and then uh, Professor Talas will uh, continue to be here and be available for questions. Uh, so uh, first question goes to Anka, to Valeria Rubako of ANSA. Valeria. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your time and for this uh, uh, very important press conference. My question is for the Secretary General. Uh, Secretary General, what is uh, as now the real support uh, of United States and China to the fights against the climate change? With the Trump administration, there is a complete closure, or you can see some margins of for working together and the same uh, for China? Thank you. There are areas of air pollution in which it is possible to work together, even with the U.S. administration, uh, but we know the position of the U.S. administration in relation to climate change as a whole. But uh, we should not underestimate the impact of the action of uh, uh, cities, businesses, and uh, uh, even states uh, that are assuming leadership in making sure that uh, even in the United States there is a very strong commitment to climate change. Now, uh, in China... Uh, there is now a very clear um, public statement of uh, their commitment uh, to climate change. Uh, and they were very constructive in the Katowice meeting. And uh, we are hoping that China, where there are still lots of problems, uh, obviously, uh, we are hoping that China will come to the summit and then to 2020 with uh, very strong, concrete commitments in relation to the reduction of emissions. Uh, yeah, pick up your. Thank you for your patience. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Sebastian Mallow with Thomson Reuters. Uh, my question is uh, for the Secretary General. Um, the report uh, speaks of the United States, it speaks of economic losses on a global scale, and it mentions that the highest losses affected the United States, resulting from two significant hurricane landfalls, Florence and Michael with a total loss estimate estimated at nearly 50 billion. So it puts the United States as the country most affected uh, by uh, extreme uh, weather or natural disasters. Um, and I wonder if you could um, tell me what this says uh, to the United States, what, what kind of uh, message this sends, uh, given the current political uh, climate. Uh, uh, climate change will have a global impact, uh, but uh, the negative impact of climate change uh, in uh, some regions of the world, and namely in the United States, uh, is already substantial and will become more and more relevant unleash, un unless we are able to globally reverse the trend. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, estimate that in a developed economy, uh, when uh, uh, storms st st strike, uh, there is potentially 
a higher volume of uh, assets that can be impacted. But on the other hand, let's not forget that developed economies also are more resilient and they have more capacity to resist to this kind of disasters. So um, obviously the number of casualties, for instance, is much more dramatic uh, when we look at uh, the recent situation in Mozambique uh, uh, because that, uh, those countries are much less equipped. Uh, they have done much less in relation to their adaptation capacity to the impacts of climate change. Thank you, Secretary General. This question is for you. Uh, one of the major uh, concerns, especially for people in like Central America and South America with the rising of the temperatures is how it affects their agriculture and how that promotes actually the movement and migration of a lot of the people because they have droughts and they have their other problems. Uh, would you think that it will be, um, and it's been talked about that this being treated as a national security problem for many of the countries because it generates other issues like migration, economic instability, um, and even um, other issues in terms of security. I think that there is a clear link between climate change and security. Uh, there has been uh, a number of important initiatives in this regard, and uh, I fully subscribe this. Uh, it is clear that... Um, Natural disasters, on one hand, the southern natural disasters, but especially the slow onset in which, for instance, desertification is progressing with the droughts that are becoming more frequent, more intense. Uh, 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 these kind of disasters are causing massive displacement, and this displacement will inevitably increase migration flows. And at the same time, uh, impacting on productivity in agriculture, it will, be, uh, it will make hunger uh, much more uh, risky uh, and it will create factors of social instability. Uh, there are, by the way, very interesting analyses when we look at history uh, about uh, the links between weather uh, 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 evolutions and political uh, issues. Uh, I recommend some interesting analyses about... Uh, uh, the weather revolution before the French Revolution, and uh, uh, some analysis, very interesting analysis about the impacts of uh, um, drought uh, in relation to the Arab Spring. I'm not uh, saying that uh, this means that there was climate change in all these circumstances. There have been, of course, different. But it is clear that there is a link, a very clear link, between climate and security, between climate and stability, between climate and well-being, of populations. I think we have time for one more question before the Secretary General and the General Assembly person need to leave. Uh, Majid? Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, this is Majid Ghali from Rudaw Media Network. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary General, I want to ask about one of the most uh, uh, underreported issue is the impact of climate change on the conflict zones and it's in the Middle East in general. And you spoke about Arab Spring just right now. Uh, how it's uh, um, researchers think it's one of the uh, roots of the cause of instability, um, especially in, in Syria. As we speak, there's major floods right now happening in Iran, K uh, Kurdistan, and Iraq. Uh, I wanted to ask you, is there any plan by the United Nations, um, which is already very involved, in, to deal with more urgent issues in the area to help local government, to help uh, authorities in those areas with regard to uh, climate change impact? And uh, uh, do you still uh, believe that uh, in more developed countries, more industrial, richer countries, are responsible to help those countries, underdeveloped countries, uh, to deal with the impacts, uh, devastating impacts of uh, climate change? Thank you. Oh, especially when discussing financing for climate change, we have been insisting that uh, that financing needs to address not only mitigation but adaptation which means we need to support especially the developing countries that are more fragile, small island development states, uh, uh, landlocked states in which drought is more uh, um, uh, dangerous. Uh, it is absolutely essential that a meaningful part of the financial support goes to adaptation. And I recognize, for instance, uh, uh, the wisdom of the World Bank that uh, has allocated now 400 million for the next five years, 400 billion for the next five years, all for adaptation and all for mitigation. So adaptation is clearly a priority for us too, not only mitigation. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, it is 
clear that uh, there is a responsibility of the global north, uh, and that is the reason why uh, uh, we are uh, fighting hard, and it is one of the areas covered by the summit, to make sure that the 100 billion that were committed, uh, both by the public and private sectors, uh, uh, to support the developing world uh, yearly after 2020, <laughs> materialize. Uh, because that is absolutely crucial, and that is why we have been very strongly insisting for the need to replenish the Green Climate Fund. And with that, uh, I would like to thank the Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly for their uh, participation. Please uh, take a pause for a second while, uh, while uh, uh, they exit from the room, and then we will continue with the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. Second, and we're just waiting for them to clear out of the room. Uh, yes, uh, James. James Bays from Al Jazeera. Secretary General, um, if I could ask you perhaps to pick up from the UN Secretary General. When he talks about runaway, irreversible climate change, you're the expert. Paint us a pic picture of what then happens in the world. Yeah, so I, I think at the, one of the key issues here is that the, the lifetime of carbon dioxide is very long. So, so the problem doesn't uh, disappear if we, if we would stop emitting uh, carbon to the atmosphere 50 years from now. So we have to find a solution in the coming decades. And if we, if we do, don't do so, then we will live with the consequences and, um, and it, 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 it will take... Uh, thousands of years to return back to the pre-industrial levels of, of, of carbon dioxide. And if we go to these higher levels of carbon dioxide, uh, we would also see a major change in the global rainfall patterns. So we would have difficulties in feeding the uh, growing global population. That's to me the main concern related to climate change. And the sea level rise uh, would continue at the pace of uh, one meter per, per century. And, and we have a potential to uh, see sea level rise uh, up to tens of meters if we melt uh, the glaciers of uh, Greenland and uh, Antarctica. So those, that would happen if we are not able to solve this pro problem in the coming, coming decades. And, and we, are going to, we expect to see growing population, especially in Africa. At the moment we have one billion inhabitants there and uh, by the end of this century there's an expectation to see four billion inhabitants and at the same time the conditions, uh, living conditions, especially in Africa, are getting poorer. So we will have more often route and, and we would have uh, difficulties in, in employment and also difficulties in feeding, feeding the population there and also worldwide. So this, uh, this food crisis is, is, is my concern. And also sea level rise. We have plenty of uh, big cities on the coastal zones in Asia, New York here, Los Angeles, uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, uh, London, several big cities are on the coastal zones and, uh, and, and we already saw here what happened with Hurricane Sandy. Southern Manhattan was, was uh, without electricity for, for a week and, and, and such events are becoming more frequent uh, because of the sea level rise and, and uh, stronger uh, storm surges in the future. So if I could just follow up, what does that mean in terms of percentages of the world's um, uh, area that will become uninhabitable? What does it mean for death tolls around the world? So, so, uh, so we would, uh, for example, in case of three de degrees warming, uh, which are the current uh, Paris pledges of the countries, uh, we would lose fairly large fraction of the global agricultural uh, production capacity. So we would uh, have 50% uh, less yields in many parts of the world, which are important uh, for the for the food security at the moment so that's to me the one of the main main risks and in the long run of, of course the sea level rise will be a will be a risky issue and, and we would have also less uh, water in the big rivers of the of, 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 of the planet so in the Asian big rivers they are having their origins in in Himalayas and uh, once you melt the glaciers we will get uh, less water in the rivers and that's it's the same problem in Europe we have uh, for example river rain 
and, and several others, uh, it's the same problem in Andean region and also in the Rocky Mountains. So there are several of these uh, risks and, uh, and, and we were also touching these economic issues and there's a recent uh, scientific study showing that the US economy would, uh, would be severely hit uh, during the latter part of this century if we, are not, if we fail with the mitigation. Uh, Oscar? Yes, thank you again for the press conference. And my question is about uh, what effects are uh, from the pirate mining over the climate change in the region in South America, or of course, all around the world? And what is the message basically in to prevent it, to, the message to the governments to prevent this? Yeah, if you look at this uh, Spanish-speaking part of the, of the world and Caribbean region, so far, we have seen the biggest uh, relative economic losses hitting the Caribbean island states. For example, 2017 hurricane season, we saw a drop of uh, GDP of St. Martin by 800 percent, a drop of GDP of, uh, of uh, Dominica by 250 uh, percent, um, and, 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 and we have certain risky issues uh, uh, besides these tropical, more intense tropical storms, uh, uh, some of the climate scenarios are showing that the Amazonian region may become drier, which would uh, endanger the ecosystem of, uh, of, uh, of that, that region. And we have stored lots of uh, carbon to the rainforests of uh, Amazonia, and if, and if it's uh, drying, then there will be a release of, uh, of carbon dioxide to the, to the atmosphere. And if you look at uh, some, uh, 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 some countries like Peru, uh, which is uh, very dry when it comes to the coastal, coastal zone, uh, the big rivers uh, that are giving uh, water to the to, to, uh, to, uh, cities like Lima, uh, uh, there's a risk that uh, the melting of the, of, the, uh, of the Andean glacier is we will have less uh, less water in the rivers, and, and that would endanger the life in, in cities like, uh, like, uh, like, like Lima. And, um, and, um, uh, and, and, and then there's a risk that we will see changes in the ocean currents. Uh, we have already seen a slowing down of the ocean current, which, uh, which is bringing uh, warm water from the Caribbean towards, uh, towards Europe, and, and there's a risk to see also also changes in the in the ocean currents uh, which are which are uh, hitting the south america both from western and uh, eastern side thank you for uh, professor talas i know you are an expert not a politician but still you are an appointee of the secretary general so my question is do you completely share his dramatic warning that we are left with a couple of years time frame for that we are beyond the point where we can, could not change anything. And also, he called for the politicians to come with a plan, not with the speeches. What is your plan B, if any, if the politician doesn't come with the plans? Thank you. Uh, so uh, so I, I, I expect that the uh, countries are coming. I'm also a steering group member of the summit, and, um, and, and, and there are several countries who are, who are going to uh, promise something new. And, and, uh, and, and, and it's important that the countries come with something concrete, and, and that's the desire behind uh, the whole Whole, whole summit and um, and and uh, we have a problem at the in, the in the UN system that we are it's a, it's a, it's a talking show and and people come to talk and uh, and 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 sometimes the impacts are not so 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 dramatic and 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 and, and the approach of this uh, summit is going to be that uh, countries are allowed to speak if they promise something new so so there are opportunities to give a boost to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And as, as I said in my presentation, if we would like to reach the slow limit of uh, Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degree, which would be the best, uh, best thing for the welfare of the coming generations, uh, 
we should uh, turn our emission growth to the to, 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 uh, downward trend uh, in the coming five years, and, and by 2050 we should be we should become carbon neutral. And if you would like to reach the two-degree target of Paris Agreement, then we have uh, something like 15 years' time to turn our emissions to 15.15 uh, to, 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 to uh, dramatic uh, drop uh, line and, and, and then be carbon neutral by 2070. And, and, and this most recent IPCC report, which was published in, in October, was demonstrating that it would be uh, ideal for the welfare of the of the mankind to aim at uh, aim at this 1.5 degree target. And, and what is the new that you consider from the speeches or the plans from the countries, the new that you mentioned? And what is your plan B if that doesn't bring the results? So, so of course, as, as a science community, we are we have made uh, calculations for various uh, options of the of, of the future, and I was showing uh, one of them in my. My, my presentation. So, if we if we fail with uh, with the climate mitigation, then we would reach uh, three to five degrees warmer planet by the end of this century, and about eight degrees warmer planet uh, by the end of next century. If we use all of the fossil fuels that we know, then we would reach uh, eight degrees warmer planet and, and a major change in in the precipitation patterns worldwide, and and also the sea level rise would continue at the pace of uh, one meter per century. So, so that would be a disaster for the welfare of the mankind uh, for the future. So, so, so uh, and, and at, the, at, the, at the summit, uh, the countries will uh, propose uh, new means uh, uh, to, to mitigate the climate change. And we have uh, both technological and financial means to reach this uh, 1.5 degree target. And, and there's, as, as, uh, as my colleague said, uh, uh, there's also need to pay attention to adaptation because this negative trend in climate will continue anyhow for the coming coming 50 years and uh, if we are successful with the mitigation we could see a plateau around 2050s 2060s yes, Stefano Vaccara la voce di New York Radio Radicale in Rome uh, Professor, I, this was a question for the Secretary General, the President of the General Assembly, but I ask you to ask them, in a sense. Uh, as you see, this room, he's, um, we are here, but it's not full. This room has been, for other occasion, I don't think so important, has been packed. This room today is not packed. So there is a problem with the message. It doesn't go through as much, at least for what you're telling us, and what the Secretary General just said. So my question for them was, what are you doing wrong? What, what, why, for example, if I tell you that there will be students watching this now live, what was not said to make them go on the square you know, more? So my question then, I guess also for you is, did you see um, Representative Congresswoman Ocasio-Ortez two days ago? She did a speech in Congress. And somebody said it was exaggerating. She was out of, uh, you know, she was because she was very, very emotional in the in the speech. But a lot of people ended up to watch it. So, what would be your advice, uh, your advice to the Secretary General and to the President of General Assembly to make finally this message, this urgent message, gone, gone through? First of all, I would like to thank all of you who are here. The most important uh, journalists are, of course, uh, present here today. So thanks for, thanks for, th thanks for coming. And um, and I have been sharing this uh, frustration. I studied meteorology in the early early 80s, and we knew about this uh, problem already then. And and uh, and the science community has been uh, publishing already five uh, major IPCC reports and, and dozens of. Uh, special reports and, um, and, and finally the message uh, has, has been heard. And we have started seeing the impacts of climate change. That has been also a game, game changer. So we have, for example, tripled the economic losses related to natural disasters during the past uh, 30 years. And, and, uh, and if, you, if you look at, listen to the speeches of uh, heads of state uh, here during the General Assembly high level week, um, uh, last year I think it was 170 uh, delegations uh, that were talking about climate change. So this is uh, the problem is uh, now understood, but uh, but uh, means to, to to mitigate. Uh, they are still 
uh, not, not ambitious enough. So this ambition level should be raised, and that's uh, that's uh, that, that that's a key key message. But uh, but we have uh, uh, the technological means to to be successful, and, and we have also economic means to be successful. And and, and this economic means uh, they are in the, in the hands of uh, private sector, and and uh, it's it's. Uh, there's a need for for the governments to set uh, such frames that it's it's attractive for the for the private sector to invest and and for example the solar and uh, wind energy they are already fairly attractive uh, things for the for the investors. Professor Secretary General, I'm sorry if I for this follow up. I was I understand that you know technically what they should do they are not doing it. Understand? I'm talking now about message media message. And because in a country, especially like country like this, like United States and, and several others, how, why the people still don't feel the urgency? So, I don't know, do you, have, do you have children, can I ask? Five. Five, very good, congratulations, I have two. If I really believed what you're telling me, and if I was now the Secretary General, I will find a way to make this message go through. In a, I don't know. I will do an special. I don't know what I will do. I will go to Times Square. So again, I ask you again the question: If you were on the place of the Secretary General of the United Nations, what you will do that he didn't do yet to make this message go through? I think that he has openly said that uh, climate mitigation is uh, highest priority. For his career here at the United Nations, so that's and, and he's uh, he's communicating these uh, issues also quite uh, extensively and and, uh, and this climate summit that he's uh, he decided to organize in September that's uh, that's supposed to be a game changer and and it's 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 uh, supposed to lead uh, uh, to to the COP25 meeting uh, which which will take place in Santiago in early December. So, so he's he's committed to give a boost to the climate mitigation, and uh, and and I'm I, 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 I'm admiring his uh, his approach uh, in that sense. And and of course we need uh, also more uh, heads of state and governments who are behind uh, behind uh, his, uh, his his thinking. And and we have some challenges worldwide uh, because of that. Yes, please the back. Yes, you. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Elena from the Lusa News Agency from Portugal, and I wanted to ask you on Cyclone Idai in um, Mozambique. Uh, I wanted to confirm if you said that you, you cannot be certain that what happened in, with the cyclone, if it was climate action change. Uh, so what happened then if it was not climate change? And um, also um, reflection on your part that these countries are already very underdeveloped and we know that the impact are very bad for underdeveloped uh, economies. Um, do you think there is uh, something we can be really optimistic about the future of Mozambique? Uh, so what, what happened in Mozambique is that, uh, as I said, uh, there are certain elements uh, which are, where we have climate change component uh, embedded. We have now warmer oceans and, and these warm temperatures of the seawater, they are observed in, in wider areas than before. And, and those uh, warm ocean temperatures, they are giving energy to the hurricanes, uh, to the cyclones and, and, and typhoons. And, uh, and because of these warmed oceans, we have started seeing growing amount of, uh, of uh, most devastating uh, tropical, tropical storms. Then we have uh, more humidity in the atmosphere because of the higher ev evaporation related to the warming and, and, and also this uh, growing amount of, uh, of uh, water vapor. It's giving more energy, uh, more power to the flooding problems related to, the, uh, related to, the, to, to such, uh, such events. And, uh, and because of climate change, we have started seeing growing amount of uh, these kind of disasters. Some meteorological services uh, in Germany and Australia, they are experimenting this year a system where they could uh, automatically identify what was the contribution of uh, climate change behind one individual event. So we will, in the coming years, be able to, able to report it, uh, but it's very likely that there was a climate change component uh, behind that. And if you compare what happened uh, after the, uh, the Hurricane Harvey in, in Texas and what happened uh, after this Ida in Mozambique, uh, there's a difference. 
in, 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 in both cases, the warning was issued and, and, uh, and, and, and the people heard the, heard the warning, but uh, the means to evacuate uh, millions of people in Mozambique uh, didn't exist. In, in, in the USA, they were able to mostly take their private cars and drive away from the, from the, from the risky, risky area. And that's the difference between a developing country and uh, a developed uh, country. So that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, where we have the difference. Uh, the good news was that, uh, that the forecast was uh, issued, and, and, and the Mozambique Meteorological Service was doing a good job. And, and from WMO's side, we have been helping the less developed countries in improving their early warning services. The, the most developed countries they are sharing their expertise and and and. and uh, and forecast the material with the less developed countries. And we are very much serving as a platform for that, for such a purpose. Luke? Uh, thanks. Uh, I've been hearing an argument from politicians in this country and elsewhere who argue um, that a climate, ambitious climate action will be too costly, particularly for poor communities. That will, it will lead to job loss. It will uh, need to take away spending from other social programs. Um, and that has caused some drafters of new climate legislation, including in this country, to say that's a cynical approach, that's a cynical argument. We need to pair climate action with other social policies, let's say jobs guarantees and other things to make sure poor people aren't turned off of this notion of, of climate change action. Do you, do you agree with the premise that disadvantaged communities are disproportionately affected by climate change? And do you, do you think pairing traditional climate-focused policies with other social welfare programs might be a, a good mixture. So, in in, in general, it's, it has been shown already a long time ago that uh, the, the mitigation action is much cheaper than to live with the consequences of climate change, and it's it has been shown that it's it's something like twentyfold uh, cheaper to mitigate uh, now than to live with the consequences, and that, that's also. Uh, there was a recent uh, U.S. Uh, science report uh, demonstrating that uh, during the latter part of this century, uh, the consequences will be uh, hitting the U.S. economy fairly hard. And, and so far, we have seen seen the uh, biggest uh, uh, numbers of, uh, of, uh, of, of losses in, 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 in the USA. For example, the, the hurricane season 2017 was the most expensive uh, year so far. And, uh, and, uh, and I have been had a chance to visit uh, some of the areas, for example, after Hurricane Katrina, I was visiting New Orleans uh, just a couple of months uh, before the, after the event, and, and it was mostly the poor people who were suffering the most. Uh, the, the rich people, they were, they, were, they were having insurances for their houses, and, 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 and they were able to rebuild the houses, but uh, the poorest people didn't have uh, insurances, and, uh, and, and, and they, were hit, they were hit the hardest, and, and they, many of them were, were, were not able to return back because, of, because they didn't have means to, to rebuild their, their houses. And of course, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for the governments to, 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 to make sure that the things are done in such a in socially solid way. And, and we have seen some movements in France, for example, they have this... Uh, this uh, this uh, yellow west uh, movement uh, uh, which was a pro first a protest against the uh, rise of uh, the gasoline prices and, and and again that was uh, that was very much the, uh, hitting the was supposed to hit the poorest uh, poorest part of the auto population so but that's that, that's a duty for the for the governments but if you if you look at the welfare of the of the people in the long run, uh, it's, it's again the poorest who are going to suffer the most and uh, it will be best for the poorest people uh, to, 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 to be successful in mitigation efforts. But how, to, how, how do you, what kind of taxing means you are using and so forth, it's, uh, you, you can do it in a smart way and you can do it in a, in a less smart way. Last question, George. Thank you. Uh, George Baumgarten, uh, correspondent for, among other media, the Astana Times in Kazakhstan. Can you tell me what are the particular unusual or unique manifestations? How uh, are the Central Asian countries in Kazakhstan in particular affected by a climate change situation? I mean, obviously, they don't get hurricanes up there. Uh, 
but what, what do they get and how does it affect their particular inland countries? Kazakhstan, I'm sure you know, is the largest landlocked country in the world. And also, incidentally, uh, with relation to, uh, with reference to Typhoon Idai, uh, I can understand uh, Mozambique being hard hit, but, uh, you know, in, in North America, the uh, hurricanes start to weaken immediately when they hit the coastline. Uh, with reference to Malawi and Zimbabwe, and I've been to all three countries, twice to Mozambique and Malawi, uh, uh, it seems to me an awful, uh, awful heck of a lot of damage awfully far inland. Thank you. Good question. So, uh, so uh, as, as I said, uh, the biggest impact of climate change uh, has so far been related to the changes in the in the rainfall patterns and, 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 and this more prevailing drought, for example, that's that's one of the problems that is hitting hitting the Central Asian countries and, uh, and and also the melting of the Himalayan glaciers is having an impact on on, on the amount of uh, water in the in the rivers and and of course we have already seen what has happened to the Aral Sea in that uh, that region. If, if if we would have more rainfall, we would have more water in the in the in, in the Aral Sea, and, and of, of course it's a it's a mixture of, uh, of human in, uh, human impact and and and, uh, and climate change uh, impact there. But uh, but these uh, changes in the rainfall amounts and, and the melting of the Himalayan glaciers, and and we have also seen uh, more often heat waves hitting the countries and, and record high temperatures, and, uh, and and they have have they have had negative impacts on the human human health. Uh, in that uh, that region, uh, in case of uh, of this uh, this uh, cyclone, the Idai, uh, we were having high wind speeds uh, also in, in the in, in the inland uh, area, Zimbabwe and, and and Malawi. But the most the most the problems uh, that were faced there were related to the rainfall amounts, and that's usually. Usually, it's rainfall amounts that are having the biggest uh, impacts. That, that has been also the case in in USA, for example. This Hurricane Harvey, which was hitting hitting Texas, uh, uh, the biggest uh, damage was caused by the by the amounts of uh, rainfall. And this was also the case uh, in Hurricane Florence, which was hitting hitting the U.S. Uh, east coast uh, uh, last year. Thank you. Thanks very much, and we'd like once again to thank uh, the Secretary General of the WMO, Mr. Pateri Talas. Th thanks very much for, for this, and uh, and uh, th thanks thank you all for coming. Bye.